Uh, again, so excited for today. If you are a guest of ours today, maybe you came back from Easter or uh, maybe a friend invited you. You picked a great Sunday to be with us um, because as, as I just alluded to, part of my assignment today from God uh, is to debunk some of the weight of religion. And uh, over the next several weeks, we're going to address some things and talk through some things. And my prayer uh, is that we would be a, a Jesus church, that we would be the type of church that does not put the weight of religion on people, but we point to people to the one who has set the captives free, which is Jesus. And so uh, during this whole series, uh, Losing My Religion is the title of it. I, I pray that we would lose it, rather we would exchange our religion for relationship with Jesus, that we would see one another, we would see the world, that we would see his church the way that he sees it. And so uh, today uh, I am uh, expectant for what God uh, would want to speak to us about uh, as we we dive into this series and I want to go to Luke chapter 7 today so if you have your Bibles um, let's go to Luke chapter 7 and uh, to, really there's there, there's two groups of people today uh, that I want to address the first is those of us who um, have surrendered our lives to Jesus we would consider ourselves uh, Jesus followers and I believe there's there's something that God wants to speak to us and there's a um, uh, a a uh, I would say a pull that oftentimes rises up on the inside of us if we're not careful. And that pull is a tug and pull towards religion. And so I want to uh, today maybe address this. this isn't for a message for the believer that is like, oh, that's so-and-so. No, my prayer is that God, would you start with me? Would you start with the plank in my eye before I start examining specks in other people? That's what the scripture tells us to do. Uh, and so the other group of people is, is those who don't follow Jesus, those who might be, be, be seeking, those who might be uh, wanting to say, you know, I'm trying to find out who this Jesus is, or maybe you're, you're returning to faith. Maybe you're, you're starting to come back to be a part of a community. And maybe for some reason you've had this thought um, that somehow you're not worthy, that somehow you're, you're not accepted, that somehow you're, you're somehow less than and I want to show you that, that, that Jesus, he ultimately levels the playing field. And there is none of us who are greater than any of us because of the one who has ascended to the heavens that came from the very heavens, which is Jesus Christ. And so Luke chapter 7, um, we're going to read about a dinner party. How many of you guys like a dinner party? Come on, dinner parties are fun. Uh, had one of those last night. Uh, we had some people over uh, to our house, which was, was fun. And uh, we did the whole barbecue thing, because that's what I do. Uh, and smoked ribs uh, for about seven hours, and they were absolutely delicious. And so uh, a dinner party we're going to read about here. Just a little a short bit of context, and I'll unpack more of this. But uh, Jesus... Uh, we're in the midst of his ministry here, about three or so years of Jesus, um, uh, Jesus' ministry that we have recorded in Scripture. And in the midst of it, he gets invited uh, over to a religious leader's house for dinner. And this religious leader um, it isn't just like, um, uh, you know, some pastor of a church down the street. This religious leader uh, is a very prominent pastor. This religious leader that invites Jesus over for dinner is, is somebody who's well known. And actually, there's other dinner guests that are uh, at this dinner party, and they would have been the religious leader's friends. They would have been his compadres, his fellow pastors. And so uh, they say, Jesus, come eat some dinner with us and hang out. And so that's what we're going to read in on today. And uh, really, we're going to find out something very awkward. Very, very awkward that takes place at this dinner party. Luke chapter 7, verse 36, it says, One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at a table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, another translation will say who was a well-known prostitute, when she learned that he was reclining at a table of a Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask of ointment and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wipe them with her hair. She, she kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him in saw this, notice now he said to himself, Meaning he either said something under his breath or it was a thought that he had. Notice what Jesus says to the thought that this religious leader has. And I'm grateful that we serve a God that even knows our deepest thoughts. So he says to him, this thought that he has in his head, he says, Hey, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this was who is touching his feet. For she is a sinner. 
Jesus answering said to Simon, okay, so now he's answering the thought that Simon had in his head. He said, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he answered, say it, teacher. He says, a certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? So Simon answered, well, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, I want you to catch this today. This is what jumped out to me. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, I want you to catch this picture. He's in a conversation with Simon, looking at Simon as he's having this conversation. Scripture says he turns towards the woman and then speaks with his back to Simon. He says, um, do you see this woman? Do you see this woman? Now you have to understand in this time in this culture, they wouldn't have even seen this woman because she would have been unworthy. She would have been overlooked for much and most of her life. She would have been an outcast of society. She would have been uh, deemed as too far gone, too dirty. Can you believe what she does for a living? So these religious leaders walked around with their heads held high, too good for many people. And so Jesus asked him a simple question. He says, do you see this woman? Which is a great question for us to ask ourselves. Do we see the people around us? Are, are our lives so busy and our lives so full that we have other priorities and things to attend to that are deemed more important? So he says, I entered your house. He says, Jesus, continue talking. He said, you gave me no water for my feet. She has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. He said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, again, here comes the gossip, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. One more passage I want to read for you today to those of you who might be inquiring about who is this God? What is he like? What is his character? What is his nature? I want to go to Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, and it simply says it this way, for he, he being Jesus, is the complete fullness of the deity living in human form. What, what is this, this scripture translated? If you are looking to find out the character, the nature of who God is, look no farther than the person of Jesus Christ. It is in Jesus that we see the fullness of the love, of the grace, of the forgiveness of God expressed through human form. You wanna know how God feels about you, how he thinks about you? Look no farther than his son Jesus. So today I want to have a conversation with us all, and um, the title of the talk that I have prepared today and feel a sign from God is this, it's a, a sinner at a Pharisee's house. A sinner at a Pharisee's house. So Holy Spirit, we thank you. We thank you for what you're doing in this environment, in this gathering today. Holy Spirit, I pray you illuminate scripture that you make it so real and relevant to us that it causes us to leave here changed and different as we have an encounter with Jesus Christ. God, we exchange our religion today for relationship with you. God, we exchange, and I pray today that you would break off the Simon that lives inside of us and help us to see others the way that you see them. God, would you go to work in this place today? Would you go to work in our homes? Would you go to work in our lives? God, we eagerly want to experience an encounter with you. So speak today, God, for your church is listening. Come on, God, our hearts are good soil. You, you, you're speaking to good soil this morning, and we declare that today. Speak to our hearts, God. They're in a place to receive from you. God, our ears want to hear your voice, Father. The voice of a stranger they will not recognize in Jesus' name. So speak gently in our ear today. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said...
A great big amen and amen. I just saw Dylan in here a moment ago. Uh, this is the last weekend you will see Dylan, our worship leader, as a single man. Where did he go? Stand on up, Dylan. Give everybody a wave. Come on. Dylan and Anna get married this week. We're so excited and happy for them and their new life together. And uh, uh, his nickname, we call him the mayor of Newberry just because he has grown up here and he knows everything about Newberry Park. So he is a wealth of Newberry Park wisdom. But anyway, we are excited for them. And um, as your pastor and pastor of the church, if you want to bless them in any way, uh, they love ragamuffin coffee, which is a Newberry Park staple. Okay. And um, while you're there, you can even venture over to the Trader Joe's, uh, Trader Jose, as I like to call it, but go to next door to Trader Joe's and get some uh, gift cards for them. They will put it to good use, but uh, we're happy, excited uh, for you guys. Um, I want to ask you a question um, as we, we we dive into this today. Um, ha have you experienced in your life, in your walk with God, um, uh, religiosity kind of rise up? Like, we would be honest throughout the room today, it's like we... Like, like th there's a Simon on the inside of me that I have to every day continue to break him apart. Like, let me say it this way. Um, um, for those of us that read scripture, and, and for those of us who don't, I would encourage you, read scripture. Read the Bible. Like, like develop a love for the word of God. But here's what I want to say, because it's you know, oftentimes what we do, and this is how most of our theologies are based, we read scripture and we approach a text that challenges us and we're like, ooh, I don't like that as much as I like that. So I like the, the, the mac and cheese, but I don't like the broccoli and the steak. And so what happens oftentimes is we have um, kind of like a pick and choose theology, which is, which is rampant right now in our nation. So like, I, I like this, um, that feels good. But here's the question. What do we do when the scriptures and teaching of Jesus conflict with our current theology today? This is the great question of spiritual growth. Like, what, what do we do when we have a text that challenges us in a way of, of what we thought it was about, which is why, like, every day I have to get into God's word. Because not only is there some, some humanness that God's breaking off of my life every day, but equally, there is some religiosity that God is breaking off of my life every single day. Like, like and we, we've all experienced this. Like, I think if we were to be completely candid and we were at a small group and I just fed you some, some smoked ribs after seven hours with some barbecue sauce and we'd be talking. And um, I, I'm sure we all that have, have been a part of church or, or following Jesus have, have dealt with or experienced some form of religiosity. Like, I've done it. I, I, I've preached messages. I remember being like a young youth pastor and, and you're preaching a text based on how you were taught the text. But yet when you read the text and you dive deeper and you do some research for yourself, you're like, ah, that's not really what he was saying. Now, I, 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 I'll share this story because this, this uh, unfortunately, um, if, you, if you go and you study um, the ministry of Jesus and the life of Jesus, um, he spent more time dealing um, against the teachings of the religious leaders than he did, let's say, casting out demons. Like, like this Jesus, he knew the, the authority that he possessed. Like, you think about the, the, these moments that he had. He commanded the winds and the waves and the demonic activity behind that. He, 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 he cast a legion into some pigs, and these pigs ran into and, and made some bacon stew in the, the, the lake. Right? It was, but a lot of the, the, the time that we see Jesus, we, we actually see him. And what is it about this Jesus that in the narrative of Scripture and the ministry of Jesus, we see him oftentimes between a sinner and between a religious person? And this is kind of our battle still today. Like, it, it, we, we, we haven't... Um, uh, grown past this much. Like, I, I'll give you a, a, a short story. One of the, the, the very first message I ever preached here almost four years ago on a Sunday. Four years ago, I would have been 29. I would have just preached my guts out. Okay, I'm telling you, it's 29. I had a radical love for Jesus. I had a word from God. We were living on great sacrifice, and I poured out my being. Gave it all. Walked off the stage. First person comes up to me, um, individual, looks at me and he says, um, how dare you disrespect God with holes in your jeans? So what I do, 
gave him a big old hug. Then the next week, what I do? I made sure that the jeans had more holes in it. Because what I was doing is in a very practical sense trying to break a stronghold of religiosity that we often will succumb to. And most of our churches succumb to. Like, I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not going to be the preacher that wears the three-piece suit every Sunday. It's just not comfortable for me. My wife, she's like, you, you kind of look like you're trying to be a businessman or something with that. Take that off. And I said, anything for you, baby, anything. And so then she gets me a sweatshirt with paint all over it. And it's like, okay, it's a great exchange. But, but isn't it funny? It, 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 and we, we often do this. And I think sometimes this is the, the challenge of, of those of us who have been following Jesus for quite some time. And based on some really bad theology and some bad teachings that we've grown up under, it kind of formulates our view of what church should be, of what loving other people should be. And it's like, if we actually knew, I wonder if we actually knew some of the people that walk through the doors and what they're going through. It would actually change some of the way that we speak to one another. So I want to, like, like, in this text, in Luke 7 here, Jesus is, like, provoking the religious leaders. Like, he's stirring up the pot. And I'll show you that. Like, like, it's in this text that he's in a pastor's home, a very well-known pastor religious leader. He is an invited guest into this home. And the, the dinner party that night w would have been made up with some, some, some very special guests, some, some elite religious leaders. They would have been, been some of the most high fluting religious, high profile religious leaders. They, 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 the house that he would have been in would have been this big prominent house. And so they're like, hey, Jesus, would you um, come into this house and have some dinner with us? And it's at this dinner that something so awkward happens that a well-known prostitute in their land barges through the door and falls at the feet of Jesus in a house that she's not invited to. Like, like, okay, like we're quiet, but think about this. You're at somebody's house, there's a dinner party. The door flings open, there's a woman who has a very bad reputation, she comes in, she throws herself at the feet of Jesus. Now think about this, because it's really interesting, this, the, 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 the reputation that this woman would have had. Like, like, like she would have not only been well known, but she would have felt like, man, I have no hope. There's no way for me to not be bound in what I'm going through. And there was this resolve that said, even in the midst of this pastor's home, there's nothing that will stop me from getting to Jesus. What is it about some of the determination of sinners when we realize that we are in need of a savior and nothing will stop us from getting to our savior? And not only did she, it's, it's interesting because when she got word that, that, that Jesus was gonna have dinner at this religious person's home, she didn't come empty handed. She brought her most expensive possession with her which would have been this flask of oil, this oil jar, this alabaster box, if you may. I want you to think about this because the, you, you can go and you can research and, and see about how many days and months worth of wage this would have been. It was such a lavished outpouring of love towards Jesus. And it's not like, like oh, she, she, she brought a little bit like when you go to the Macy's and you're testing the perfumes, you do the spray thing. No, she, culturally, if you understand the alabaster box, she would have had to break that box completely with tears pouring down her face, using her own hair to wash the feet of Jesus in the midst of the top religious leaders of their time, weeping and anointing the feet of Jesus with her most prized possession. Listen, when you realize what you've been saved from, you realize that there is no possession that you have that you will not pour out on the feet of Jesus. There, there is nothing too rich or too expensive to say, God, if you command, I will. She has this, this heart, and, and just, just think about how awkward this is. And, and it's in this awkward environment that these religious leaders are around a the table, 
This woman is washing the feet of, of Jesus. The aroma of this very, very expensive perfume now is permeating the house. And then they start this conversation and this dialogue with the feeling. Now, now, now think about this. Everybody wants her to go away. Okay, like, like it's kind of like, what are you doing here? You ever been at a party that you weren't invited to? And everybody kind of gives you that like weird look, like with you or. <laughs> and then they start doing the weird things. Like, like opening up your refrigerator, the uninvited guest. Think about how awkward the tension in this room. Here she is at the feet of Jesus at this dinner table. Verse 39, it says, now, when the Pharisee who had invited him in and saw this, he said to himself, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. So like, he thought this, this religious pastor thought this in his mind. What is this woman doing touching Jesus? And the ultimate issue with this religious person was he did not see Jesus as the son of God. So he says, hey, if this was really Jesus, he would know who's touching up on his feet. Well, newsflash, by the way, not only does Jesus know who's touching up on his feet, he knows the thought you just had. So then he says, Simon, let me, look, before I get there, I, I, here's the, let me say this. We, we have to come to a, a realization that there is a Simon inside of every one of us. There is a perplexity to lean towards Simon, especially the longer that we've been following Jesus. And there's something about this Jesus that almost came to disrupt the institution, kind of disrupt some things and show accurately the love, the compassion, the mission of Jesus, of his father in which sent him. Verse 40, so Jesus now responding to the thought that Simon had. He said, uh, Simon, I have something to say to you. So Simon says, say it, teacher. Simon says. <laughs> that worked out well. Um, it's interesting because if you go and you study scripture, um, Jesus, when he had something to say, what would he typically do? He'd just say it. What was it about this time that he had to almost draw more attention to say, I have something to say to you? Like, like, like we know this. Any parents in the room? Like, there's, um, there's conversations that we just have with our kids, but then there's like the, we're going to talk when we get home. <laughs> it's different, right? It's putting more attention on the conversation that's about to happen at home. So Jesus is saying, hey, I have something to say to you. So he draws attention to it. Verse 41, it says, a certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? So Simon says, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. So he said to him, you have judged correctly. Now, it's interesting because there is no accidents in Scripture. Like, there's, there, there's, there, there, there's nothing in Scripture that just so happened to get here. Like, even the teaching of Jesus to use 500 and 50 denarii as the debt. If you understand numerology, even in scripture, the number five, which 550 is a derivative of, is the number of grace. So what's he saying? He's saying, I don't care if you have a debt that's 500 denarii or a debt that is 50 denarii, I have come to cancel them both. This is the good news. God, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for this good news. 
And I'm gonna show you the tension why most of us don't get excited about this anymore. And I'm gonna show you in this text what happens next is really interesting. So Jesus this whole time up until what we've been reading has been having a conversation with Simon, looking at Simon. Now he pivots and turns his back to Simon while looking now at this prostitute sinner of a woman with a horrible reputation, but he's still talking to Simon. Okay, culturally then, culturally today, this would still be disrespectful. Like if you come up to me after service and I'm having a conversation with you and then I turn my back on you and I'm like talking to somebody else but I'm still talking to you, it's rude. So Jesus turns his back now on this religious person, Mr. Simon, while still having a conversation with him, now looking and facing the sinner. Here's the thing I want you, you to gather out, and I think this pivot, this shift is happening across the church of America right now. We have become so focused on our little religious gatherings, on all these little things that we made it, and God's saying, I've come for a greater mission, and my great mission is the co-mission, which we are to turn and shift our focus on those in which God's called us to love. Oh, but I, I like my religious rituals and routines, and this feels good. This little comfortable country club is so fun. Jesus would have a lot to say to us, church. So he turns towards this, this sinner, and it says in, in verse 44, it says, Then turning to the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? Do you see her? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Okay, I'll, let's just go a little deeper here. Culturally, at this time, it was custom that when you have an invited guest over, that there was some form of feet washing that would take place, some form of anointing, whether it was the feet or somebody's head. You would greet them when they came into your home with a kiss. Okay, so think about this. So Jesus now has showed up to a house, a religious leader's house that he's been invited in. And oh, by the way, Jesus was disrespected by this religious leader. He's not the only one at this party. And I, I, I go to wonder, I wonder who showed up first if Jesus got there a little bit before some of the other guests and he would have watched this religious leader greet all of his religious compadres with a kiss, watch their feet, and anoint them with oil. What is it about this Jesus in this moment? What it was is that these religious leaders did not believe Jesus to be who he is. And so they disrespected him. Now, when you, I'm gonna provoke you, I told you that, okay, so this is gonna poke at you a little bit. This might disagree with some of your um, uh, theology a little bit. In, in this scripture, in the scripture that we read, who does Jesus commend? What? Jesus commends sin? No. Because if you actually go, you, you, you realize what took place in this woman's life and what she had just been saved from. She had an encounter with Jesus that changed her life, that when she had a very real encounter with Jesus, she didn't want to go back to be who she was, which is the true sign of salvation. When I've surrendered my life to Jesus, I am a new creation. The desires of my past, the things I was living for, no longer are tasteful to me because I have a new taste. I've got a new purpose, a new mission to live for. And that's what took place in this prostitute's life. But what is it about this text that Jesus commends this sinner woman and this whole time he's denouncing the ways in which not only he was received, but ultimately how they would have treated this sinner. Now, 
what Jesus is ultimately saying as he says this. And here's the issue in this. The religious leaders did not see Jesus as special. He didn't even add up to their fellow pastors who would have been at this dinner party. Which I wonder if Jesus would have something for us even to, 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 to examine and how we are at responding to the reverence, to the awe of God, to the glory of God. I think we, we, we say terms and we read terms like this and we just don't know what to do with them in modern church anymore. And so it's like, yeah, we wanna see your glory. But it's not like the power of God can come in and change my life, can change your circuit. There, there, there's an awe, there's a reverence for that. But we have a challenge seeing Jesus as who he truly is. And she came on the contrary with what? They didn't greet Jesus, the religious people. She brought the very best possession that she had and smashed it open on the ground. And began with her tears to clean his feet. I wonder these tears of pain that were dripping down from this lady's face. As flashing before her would have been all of the junk that she had been caught up in. And realizing this is the one that has saved me and has set me free. And those tears that are pouring down her face realizing that she would be in this moment, wanted to bring her very best with her to pour out on the feet of Jesus. It's amazing how we will give so many other people and things our best and we give Jesus just a little bit of what's left over. It's not only material possessions, but even in our very beings. We want to be on and be good for this, this, and this, and this, and it's like, oh yes, yeah, Sunday's here. I'm tired this week. I'll go back to church in a couple of weeks. I'll read my Bible someday. What does it look like to give God our very best, to live our life in the way that this sinner has demonstrated for us? Here's the point that I, I wanna lead to because it's interesting in this text. Simon wants to talk about performance. If this is the son of God, if he is a prophet, he would know the performance and the past of this woman. But what does Jesus want to talk about? Jesus wants to talk about forgiveness, which you should write this down. Religion always wants to talk about performance. Jesus wants to talk about forgiveness. Like this is the good news. It's not that once I'm saved, I have this performance. No, it's in response to Jesus. I've surrendered my life. I know that as I seek him first in his kingdom, there is going to be good fruit that pours out of my life. I'm not as much focused on all the fruit that I'm producing. I'm focused on the one that is my source, the one that has healed me, the one who has saved me. I'm gonna invite the worship team up and then you, you, this, this, this lady bringing her best, weeping, poured out on the feet of Jesus, clean, cleaning his feet. Verse 47 says, therefore I tell you, her sins which are many are forgiven for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, here comes the gossip, right? They're, they're, they're speaking to themselves about, who is this? Who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Think about the turmoil that she probably had lived in, the reputation. She's encountered Jesus and now she's a new creation and Jesus says it's your faith that has saved you, not your performance, go in peace. Now, it's interesting to me because I, I think here's the, the challenge of it. Jesus doesn't explain how he forgives here. He just says you're forgiven, which is really interesting because 
he makes that statement, he who's been forgiven little loves little. And I think this is the challenge, especially for those of us who've been following Jesus for quite some time, or those of us who would, um, I'll just say is self-righteous, who wouldn't deem our sins or our past as that bad. <laughs> because that's what the religious people thought. I believe the reason they didn't honor Jesus is because they didn't think that they were that bad in and of themselves. I've only got 50, 50 denarii. What, 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 what? Of course, the person who's been forgiven is 500 is going to love more, which makes sense at a practical level. But the work of God goes beyond the practical level. And if we understand the narrative of Scripture, let's ask Jesus, hey, Jesus, what sin would you deem greater than the other? Playing field level. So the challenge is, is because we don't think that our sin is as bad as that person. I think the point that I'm trying to, to, to make here is the good news has grown old to us because we think we're good. <laughs> as little as I think I've been saved from or as much as I have been delivered and saved from, I am so grateful for Jesus. It is why I am committed to preaching the good news of Jesus. If you're gonna be a part of this church, you're gonna hear the gospel preached almost every single week. It's the main message of Jesus Christ. It's the thing he commissioned us to go out and do. And so in our search of wanting more, and I get all that, but I tell you, I'm not here to preach with some type of eloquent speech, but I believe it is the power and the authority authority and the supernatural activity of God that can go in and change your life. And we will be more committed to creating environments where both religious and the sinner can coexist in the presence of God. And who are we to judge somebody else based on their walk, based on where they're at? Jesus would actually say, I have something to say to you, Simon, to the Simon on the inside of me. Do you see this woman? Do you see the work I'm doing in this land? I pray that we are that church, that we start seeing people walk in here that you're saying, Whoa, you, 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 yes, you, God love you that much. Who are we church to play the role of the judge? We have to break religiosity. I believe this religiosity is being broken in this land. It's being broken in our American churches because we've gotten really good at preaching religion and we've clouded up the ability for people to see Jesus. And yet Jesus, if you were to go and study scripture, it's in this same time frame that he teaches this teaching, come to me, all who are weary and burdened. And guess what they're burdened from? Guess what the weight of it is? It's religion and I will give you rest for your soul. We've muddled down the good news. Like, we don't think the good news is good enough. Like, the, the response to the good news is like, oh my gosh, that is so good. I, I, I need that. I, I, I'm dry. I'm broken. I, I'm hanging on by a thread. I, I feel hopeless. I feel shameful. I feel unloved. I feel unworthy and you're telling me this good news about my creator that's created me and my choice has pushed me away from him but if I place faith in this Jesus it means that I will be washed clean of all the junk and be forgiven and set free from the entrapment of religion so that I can walk in relationship with Jesus yes I want that yes give me more of that this is the response to the good news so does the gospel still work today in America? Oh, heck yes, you better believe it does. I want to I, I close. I want to show you the face of Jesus. Because why was it in this text that, why, why was it in this text that he couldn't have just finished this conversation with Simon, but he had to turn towards this woman? Think about this. Put yourself in the sinner's, in the prostitute's shoes. I'm dirty. 
I'm unclean, I'm unworthy. I've been overlooked and cast out from society. And Jesus turns his entire being, his countenance towards this lady. What I believe was happening, his face, his face was healing her soul, was healing her emotion. It was a face of love. It was a face of acceptance. It was a face that says, this is my daughter. I have come for you. Let's go a little deeper. Remember Matthew 9? I believe it's Matthew 9. <laughs> This woman that's been sick and ill for 12 plus years, been bleeding. Culturally, she would have been another outcast. She would have been another one that would have been deemed, um, uh, she's been to the doctors, they can't fix her. You're just too dirty, you're too broken. Go, go find a separate place to live. Please remove yourself away from this community. So this same woman hears about Jesus, sees Jesus, and she thinks if I can just kind of sneak behind Jesus a little bit and kind of blend in with the crowd and just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. So it happens. So she sneaks in, she tries to hide, she touches the hem of the garment. Scripture says that immediately, 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 instantly, I'm telling you, immediately, immediately, instantly, Jesus can heal you. But what happens next is very interesting. Because Jesus could have kept going, like she received her healing, she's good. What's he do? He stops. He stops on his journey. The journey was very important where he was headed. He stops. And what's the scripture say? It says, Jesus turned around. What's he doing? He's looking at the woman that was an outcast, that was unloved, that was dirty, that was broken, that nobody would make eye contact with. Her life for the last 12 years would have heard, you're ooh, you're ooh, ooh, her, get her out of here. She's disgusting. Keep her away from us. She can't be cured. Well, now she's cured. And not only physically is she cured, but she's looking in the face of her healer. She's looking in the face of her father. And it is a face that I believe is a smile. It is one of good cheer. So for those of us who think that God is some furrow browed angry God at us, let's go all the way back to where we started. For it is in Jesus that we see the full deity of our Father. It is in Jesus that we see the expression, that we see the character and nature of God. Well, what about all that Old Testament, that Old Covenant stuff? Oh yeah, that's there for a reason, because it shows our need for a Savior. And God didn't withhold anything when He sent His one and only Son to rescue us, to redeem us, to save us us to set us free amen this is good news I want to read this text this text is Charles Spurgeon who would be in church history probably next to Jesus and the Apostle Paul Charles Spurgeon is up there he one of his nicknames is the Prince of Preachers the text that I'm about to read, he has deemed this text the, 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 the monumental text of Scripture. He has deemed this the richest, most full text that we have in the living Bible. Here's the text. Here's what he says, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This is the writings of Paul. He says, but we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Jesus Christ is the the image of God should shine on them for we do not preach ourselves but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your bond servants for Jesus' sake for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God where in the face of Jesus the glory of God that you're looking for, the love of God that you're looking for, the approval of God that you're looking for is found in the face of Jesus. 
Would you stand to your feet throughout this room today? I wanna, I'm gonna do this. I didn't do this in the last service. I'm gonna do it right now. Some of you are far from God. You feel just like this, this, this sinner. You feel just like this prostitute. You feel shameful. You feel caught up in your sin. You feel too far removed. And you're saying, I'm ready to come to the feet of Jesus today to bring my very best to him and surrender my life to this savior. And if that's you today, I'm gonna ask you to be so bold right now in Jesus' name. I'm gonna count to three. And when I count to three, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand. If you're watching online right now, I want you to click this raise hand button that's gonna come across the screen. Here we go, you don't need me to say more. This is the power of God, the gospel that's at work. One, God loves you. Two, today is the day of salvation. Three, if you're saying, Pastor, would you include me? Pastor, today is my day of new beginnings and new life in relationship with God. You thought you came to church for a reason, but God got a hold of your life. If that's you today, would you slip up your hand in Jesus' name? Come on, thank you, Jesus. Jesus, you're moving. Jesus, you're working. Jesus, we love you. We've got somebody online that has clicked the raise hand button that says, yes, I'm following Jesus. Anybody in our gathering right now, I don't want to move past this moment. We got two people, three people now online that are responding to the message of Jesus. Five people right now online that are responding to the message of Jesus. I told you this news is good. We got somebody in the room over here. Thank you, Jesus. We're praying for you. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, we love you. I want to say a prayer. If you, you're watching, since most of you, I think all of you are online today. I'm going to say this prayer. I want you to repeat this after me. And I pray that the Holy Spirit breaks you right now on your couch or wherever you're watching from. That you realize that God is so real. That he loves you so much. That his expression towards you is one of love. It is one of acceptance. And today you're saying I can no longer stay the same. Because I have received new life in Jesus Christ. And I'm ready to submit my life to him. We're going to say a prayer. And I want you to use the words that we're going to say together as your own words. To mean them with everything in your being. Would you say God. Come on, say it with your chest. Say, God, thank you for loving me with a steadfast and stubborn love. I admit that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. And so I confess and I believe and I place faith in Jesus Christ to be the leader, to be the Lord, to be the Savior of my life. And I declare, from this moment forward, I will never be the same again. In Jesus' name we pray. Can we lift our hands and respond in worship today? Can we cry out to the face of God today? Can we talk about this look of Jesus? Come on, let's lift our voice. One look is changing your life. Come on, he's healing your body.